Hi, with the waters receded and the ark landed, we come to the end of Genesis 9. And as we see on the left side of our screen in the beginning of our passage today in 918, the sons of Noah who went out of the ark with him, went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was peopled. So immediately we see that Ham is singled out in this initial description for being the father of Canaan. Shem and, and Japheth's children are not named, although they will be in detail in chapter 10 in the Table of Nations. So we come to a passage which has been abused in countless and dangerous ways, especially in the name of black racism and slavery throughout history. So it's one of the issues we have to look at here. And in our journey through Genesis, we've already seen several examples of how bad interpretation, which is to say, not interpretation that I or you might disagree with just because we don't like it, but interpretation that doesn't honor what the book of Genesis is in terms of its language and cultural context and the other tools of engagement that we've been using throughout this and the various series in this Radical Bible program. So we saw how in the Garden of Eden story uh, it could be used to justify uh, the inferiority of women and of patriarchy, uh, totally against the meaning of the story. We see here today how it can be used to justify slavery against black people, and we'll see later in the course in the infamous bad interpretation of the Sodom and Gomorrah story, how it can be used to justify condemnation of homosexuality. So uh, just as a Supreme Court once said about uh, censorship, the answer to bad speech is better speech. The answer to bad interpretations is better interpretations. So I hope the outcome here is not to throw out the baby with the bathwater, which is to say not to reject the Bible as if, or Genesis as if it was their fault, but to reject bad interpretations and learn how to read correctly within the context. And that doesn't mean we're going to get to right answers, because well, you can see from the, ch the chart of issues in this story on the right side of the screen, some of these uh, questions do not have clear answers, but it's important to raise them because there are things that come up from the story. So let's just jump right into this list of issues and see uh, how this goes. So first, the relationship between this story and the stories before it in the Garden and Cain and Abel story in, in topic number one and the stories that follow in the Table of Nations and Tower of Babel uh, on question number two. Um, there are many uh, parallels between the Garden and Cain and Abel story, and rather than uh, make my own chart, I'm using the chart here from Devorah Steinmetz's uh, article about this, and it's, it's wonderfully done to compare, as you see on the left, the motif, then Adam, and then Cain and Noah. There are a couple of little things I take issue with. For example, as you see down under prohibition, the three down, it says under Adam, God prohibits sin explicitly, except that that's not what happens. Sin is not mentioned in the garden story at all, either in chapter two or three, as my earlier video showed. But apart from that small detail, we see the wide range of motifs that are similar in these stories. Uh, and as many authors have suggested, these represent the three different worlds of Genesis. So Adam and Eve in the garden, and only in those opening chapters, Cain in the world between the garden and the flood, and all that, of course, destroyed in the flood, and now Noah in the world uh, as we know it, so to speak, the world after the flood and outside the garden. So we see a wide range of parallels here, and uh, I'm not going to explore these in detail. The chart actually has more parallels than I can put on the screen at one time. I'll post this on the website so you can look at it for yourself in whatever detail you'd like or use it in a small group study. Um, but it's worth spending time comparing all these and why the biblical author might be repeating this similar kind of pattern. And we see that some of the issues here are um, uh, prohibitions relating to somehow to the earth, um, a warning, something about sexuality there, uh, and a punishment and some kind of outcome. And one of the things that, that Steinmetz and others note, as well as um, Theodore Hebert, whose uh, article we'll look at in just a second, is the decreasing centrality of God. Um, so God was involved directly with Adam and Eve, and then God warns Cain, but then leaves Cain alone, and Cain turns away from God, and then God's not involved directly in the story we're looking at today at all. Um, so uh, a pattern uh, exists the leading up to this point. Um, as to the stories that follow in the Table of Nations and the Tower of Babel, partly what's at issue there is this relation between Ham and Canaan and why it is that Canaan is being cursed and what the, the three sons of Noah uh, and their various um, progeny relate to in the world of the original authors and what that might say about Genesis' attitude toward outsiders. And we'll look at that more as we look at chapter 10 and 11 and come back to this. And then finally, in terms of uh, intertextual context, intratextual context like this, uh, other places in Genesis, we'll see the story uh, in Genesis 19 of Lot's daughters getting him drunk uh, and having sex with them. And as the story ends with these verses here, Thus, both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and named him Moab. He is the ancestor of the Moabites to this day. 
The younger also bore a son, named him Ben-Ami. He is the ancestor of the Ammonites, ancestor of the Ammonites to this day. So in both stories, uh, alcohol, sex, um, yeah, and intercourse here, or maybe not intercourse in the Noah stories, we'll see, uh, leads to the generation of one of the traditional enemies of Israel. And uh, what we're seeing here for the first time is a tension between what we saw in Genesis 1, that all human beings are made in the image of likeness of God, and the specialness of what will become the Israelites, uh, much later in the book of Genesis, literally the sons of Israel, uh, the name that God gives to Jacob um, later, in the, later in the book. And so the Israelites, looking out toward the people around them, can affirm both that everybody is created in the image and likeness of God, and yet some of the people are created in ways that are, are suspicious. And I'm not saying to try to justify it. I'm certainly not saying it to say that's God's idea, uh, but to say that it connects these stories as ways of justifying why they would see some of their neighbors as less than. So with that context, let's look a little bit at the beginning of our story, and that'll lead us into the questions of 4 and 5. What exactly did Noah do and did Ham see? And why is the curse on Canaan if it was Ham who saw his father's nakedness? Um, so the three sons of Noah from these, the whole earth was peopled. Um, here we see Ha'eretz, and we'll see that as important because in the next verse, a man of the soil is Adamah, not of um, the Eretz. Uh, earth is in another word for earth, but Eretz is usually used, used for land. So Eretz Israel is the land of Israel. And Adama, as we recall from the, the garden story, is what uh, the Adam was made from. So, so this unusual designation of Adama as soil here, when but it's, it's not wrong. It's certainly the area of the land that, from which agriculture will come, and that's what happens here. So uh, the whole Eretz is peopled, but Noah is a man of the Adama. And the first to plant a vineyard. And we've seen other firsts earlier. We saw that in the, the Cain story. For people who see civilization as a progressive and the positive sense development from a quote-unquote primitive past, these firsts mark um, evolutions in a positive way. Uh, as Westerman's note uh, has down below, um, advance in civilization, benefits of civilization, etc. But I, I want to suggest I have earlier, that's simply a prejudice of the meta-narrative that Westerman um, and others take, that our world is better than their world that the world that we have of civilization, etc., uh, is what is uh, advanced, uh, unquote, quote, unquote, from the earlier world. And in, ironically, I suggest that Genesis, I've seen all along, is just the opposite. The civilization, to say the world of cities, is the problem that they're trying to avoid. The first to plant a vineyard. And there's some humor here. It must be meant to be humorous because in verse 20, he plants a vineyard. And in verse 21, he drank some of the wine and became drunk. But it doesn't take being a horticulturalist or a wine grower to know that doesn't happen overnight, that vineyards take many years to develop wine. And so he had to wait a long time for that glass of wine. We can only imagine how thirsty he was for it after going through the, the ark and flood experience. But since there's no store he could go to, he had to do it this way. So he's the first to plant a vineyard. Vineyard, and really it's the first person other than Cain to engage in agriculture. And when we did Genesis 4, um, one interpretation of that story was the choice of agriculture was the problem um, that his brother Abel uh, chose shepherding instead of being a farmer, and that's the problem. But we'll see more of that as we go. But that's not the issue here. The issue isn't condemnation of um, vineyard, uh, although it does link Noah in, um, in uh, rabbinic exegesis with three people whose sins started from agriculture. So as you see in my note from Genesis Rabbah, uh, three had a passion for agriculture and no good was found in them, Cain, Noah, and Uzziah. And I won't get into Uzziah's story, but if you want to see it, you can see it there in 2 Chronicles 26.10. So Noah, associated by the rabbis with uh, other people who are, don't have positive uh, reputations, and yet um, Noah was described as a, a good man in his generation. Uh, well, now he's outside the ark and we'll see other things happening. So he drank some of the wine and became drunk. And as scholars note, drunkenness itself is not regarded in itself as reprehensible. It depends upon how one uses it. And that's not the issue here. It's not that Noah um, behaves in some drunken way that's condemned. Uh, he's, it's not his behavior that's being condemned. We'll see it's Ham's behavior that's condemned. And so he lay uncovered in his tent. And the word for uncovered here, gala here, is used a number of times 
um, but mostly uh, for uncovering nakedness, connection with this word here, ervath, especially in Leviticus 18. And I won't go into that in detail, but I just want you to see the pattern of this. So let's go to Leviticus 18, and we can see how this is uh, this phrase is the key phrase throughout this. None of you shall approach anyone near of kin to uncover nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, etc., etc. And one of the issues that scholars uh, grapple with, and this is the question uh, for theme four here, is do we take that literally? Is it simply his father's nakedness? And that's something that should be prohibited to see, even though in our cultural context, male nakedness amongst each other, and certainly father and son, would not be anything to be ashamed of. Or is this a euphemism for various kinds of sexuality? In other words, to uncover the nakedness of your mother is incest. It's not just seeing the nakedness, it's engaging in a sexual act with that person. So one interpretation is that Sam saw the naked, Ham saw the nakedness of his father, which is to say he uh, incestuously raped him while he was asleep. And that certainly would be a horrible thing. But uh, how would anybody know that? Um, that's one possibility. Another possibility that scholars argue with was that maternal uh, incest, um, the nakedness of his father would be parallel to the nakedness of his mother, according to Leviticus, which begs the question of whether the Genesis authors or audience knew the book of Leviticus or not. Um, my take has been all along that these are both exilic texts, uh, and maybe the authors knew each other in Babylon, and maybe not, but we don't know that for sure. Um, so really, um, on the question of what exactly did Noah do, I think we need to leave that wide open. Um, he was was naked in his bed, and maybe it's a euphemism, maybe it's not. And one of the ironies here of scholars spending much ink and much time arguing about that is the book of Genesis, as we've seen already and as we'll see throughout, often leaves things like this ambiguous, certainly intentionally, not for us to get our heads together and try to ferret out what the story didn't tell us, but to let it be ambiguous and just not have answers. But obviously for the Western intellectual mind, grounded in, often in Greek categories of right and wrong and truth and not, um, ambiguity can be difficult. And it can also be the basis for doctoral dissertations. Uh, so um, we don't, just don't know. Uh, but he told his two brothers outside. What he told them, we're not really sure. Um, and uh, his two brothers here named uh, as the first of our context after the flood with trouble among brothers. And we'll see that many times, uh, certainly with um, Isaac and Ishmael and Jacob and Esau and then Joseph and his brothers later. So in response to this, we see, um, note, and I note here, the series of concrete verbs marking the brothers' behavior. And... Um, this note from Wenham helps us to hear the pace here. In contrast to the terse brevity with which Ham's deed is described, the descriptions of Shem and Japheth's response is distinctively repetitious and long-winded. The slower pace allows the listener not only to reflect on these sons' modesty, but to visualize the awkwardness of their task. And so let's look carefully at, at the awkwardness as described here. Shem and Japheth took a garment, um, uh, Hisamala, uh, here, a similar um, regular garment used as a blanket or an outer coating, laid it on both their shoulders. And notice that you see my note below from Kasudo that there's alliteration there, uh, catching with Shem, Al Shekem Shen Ayem. So uh, alliteration and rhyme is something the biblical authors often like to do, and other sound issues that are lost in translation. Laid it on both their shoulders, and we can see how awkward that would be. Certainly one person could do it. This is not like this is a heavy item. It's just a piece of cloth, like a blanket. Um, but doing this emphasizes their solidarity. So it's two brothers against one, and we know how threesomes can be awkward that way. And so then not only do they lay it on both their shoulders, they walk backward, which is to say not to see their father's nakedness. And that certainly suggests that it's simply the nakedness because um, his father's drunk and asleep, and there's certainly no sexuality going on there. So if the nakedness of their father in verse 23 is the same as the nakedness of his father in verse 22, it would simply be nakedness. But again, we can't answer that. So they're walking backwards, their faces turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done, and we, of course, as readers have to go, how did he know? If he was asleep, how did he know? Uh, when we get to the Lot story of his daughters, and he was drunk, and uh, really, no other way to put it, raped two nights in a row by his daughters, uh, we don't see any objection at all. Um, and from that perspective, when we get to Lot, how could he do that and not know? Because it says he engaged in intercourse enough to get them pregnant. But there's no activity suggested here that Ham did anything to Noah. And so how would he know? And we don't know how he knew. But that's a theme that certainly, as the Steinmetz chart showed, connects us with the Garden of Eden story and with the Cain story. Uh, and what his youngest son had done to him. And this reverses 
um, the tradition that we're going to see throughout the rest of Genesis where the norm that the older son would get the blessing is reversed. And so uh, Ishmael is the older son, but Isaac gets the blessing and Esau is the older son only by a few minutes and uh, Jacob gets the blessing. Uh, notice that Rashi, the great medieval Jewish commentator, translates here as contemptible rather than little, um, his younger son. Literally, it's his small son. So it could reply, refer to age or it could refer to height or size or it could refer uh, here to status. Um, and it's ambiguous as to whose youngest son is at issue. Is it Noah's son, Ham, or Ham's son, Canaan? Um, and another ambiguity here. So um, that's, that at least gets us through question, question theme four. And now look at uh, theme five. Why is the curse on Canaan if it was Ham who saw his father's nakedness? Because that's what we see here. Um, and cursed be Canaan, lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers, and then to bring the rest of our scene down here, blessed by Yahweh my God be Shem, and yet Canaan be his slave. Uh, a number of things we have to look at there. First of all, on the question of why is the curse on Canaan, the only answer we can offer is, I don't know. Um, and really, any attempt to answer that is pure speculation, no matter how much it's, it's coated in scholarly garb. We just don't know. One of the most common vehicles for trying to answer this question that really I don't think can be answered is to posit a series of previous versions of the story, and there are endless ones of those, entire books written on them, scholars arguing endlessly back and forth of whether the quote-unquote real story behind this story, at least the earliest one, says something different to resolve this confusion. But it's nothing of speculation. There's no real evidence to support any of that. So uh, it's not of my interest to follow that. You are welcome to if you like. Um, but the curse is this. Curse be Canaan, lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers. Notice to his brothers, literally in my note below, slave of slaves. Not that he would be a slave to his brothers, slaves would be an inferior and despised slave of his brothers, according to Casuto. Um, and I note also below the transformation of the word ebed, which is often used in a positive sense as servant here as uh, rather than humans being servants to the soil, rather being a servant to another servant. So it's another human. So a hierarchy is being established to, to justify this. And we haven't seen that before at all. Uh, and before I go back to the curse, um, notice the blessing here. So curse and blessed. And these cursing and blessing has been used throughout history as if it was God's doing it. As if the fact that it's in the Bible means Canaan is in fact cursed. But that's a very horrible misreading. And I really want to emphasize that. Because this is simply a human being expressing this. And if one thing is clear in the book of Genesis, God has the power. And whatever power humans have is derived from that. But humans do not have the power to bless and curse directly. Rather, it's simply expressing their wish. And we'll see that in depth in the Jacob and Esau story, where they fight over the paternal blessing from their father Isaac. In the end, it makes no difference whatsoever, because the only real blessing comes from Yahweh. Because the language of blessing and curse, as we saw in the garden story, relates to the question of fertility or lack of fertility. It's not just simply a negative term in general, like, you know, cursing somebody, like, go away from me. But to be blessed is to be given fertility and life, and to be cursed is to have life removed and death. And we see that most classically in the book of Deuteronomy, where they're in parallel. I said before you, blessing and curse, life and death, choose life. And so uh, what he's claiming here is that Canaan's life will be a dead end. But he does not have the power to do that. Only Yahweh has the power to do that. So what we can really say here is this is simply the father's opinion. He's simply expressing his personal judgment. And even though in verse 26 he claims Yahweh's authority, Yahweh's not a direct character here. And, and we know not only from Genesis but elsewhere, simply claiming God's on your side does not mean God is on your side. And so the only trustworthy way in Genesis that we can claim that God says something is when God says something, not when somebody else says God says something or when somebody else attributes to God an intention that's not revealed in the text. So all the historical agony over the meaning of this curse could be avoided if we simply recognize it's simply Noah's opinion. Um, so let's go down to question number six here. What does this story reveal about the outcome of the flood in terms of human evil and violence and the relationship with God, non-humans, and the earth itself? And the answer is nothing has changed. Um, as we saw uh, in God's action at the end of the flood, um, violence is allowed and people are no longer expected to be vegetarians but are allowed to kill animals to eat them. But the dread of humans is put on animals to give the animals a fair chance. And so a, contest a, con um, a conflictual world, uh, but not any different. Humans are still inclined toward violence and evil and all God can do is try to put some kind of fence around it. And of course that's part of the image later rabbis use for the Torah itself as the fence that keeps 
the people of Israel within a safe ground within Yahweh's realm, rather than out there in the wild chaos um, without any kind of controls. So it continues here with, may God make space, and the word for make space literally in the hiphal means to enlarge or disperse, only here in Genesis or Hebrew scripture as hiphal. Uh, it's a pun on Japheth, Japheth, as you can see there, may God, Japheth, Japheth here, or make, uh, may God make Japheth great. But notice there, it's simply a, a, a desire for God to do something. It's not any claim that Noah has the power to make that happen, but Noah's hoping that God will make that happen. In other words, it's a typical thing that a parent might say to a child in, the, in loving them that they hope their life is good. And let him live in the tents of Shem, uh, here, um, whether that's God or Japheth in the tents of Shem, uh, let him live here. Um, Shikan here is uh, used a few times in Genesis, but um, a different word often used for settle or settling, as we'll, as we'll see later, and we saw in 4.16. And let Canaan be his slave. Um, and then we'll turn to verse 28 as part of chapter 10 as we go. So having read the story, let's look at these last, um, last couple of questions. I already answered question 7 about the power of the human curse in relation to question 5. And then we get to the final one, the curse of Ham. How has the curse of Ham become a primary source of justification for racism and slavery of black people? And it certainly has to a horrible extent. And here's uh, an example from Bible Odyssey, a tool I've been using um, from the Society of Biblical Literature, which gives you a short answer to this question about how the curse of Ham used to justify slavery is a function of just a radical misreading of the text. And various uh, scholars that I've looked at go back to try to trace that to early rabbinical teaching or early Christian teaching. And no matter where we try to chase, trace that interpretation back, it's just wrong. There's nothing in the story about that. There's nothing about color here. In the Table of Nations, we'll see some of the descendants of Ham are people we might describe as dark-skinned, but not all. Um, for example, Egypt. Uh, I don't think most people think of Egyptians as black. Um, so um, it's just simply a bad interpretation. But there are dozens of books on the subject, and um, it's just simply wrong. So um, all I can say about that is um, do not let anybody use the quote-unquote curse of Ham as a justification for black inferiority or even worse for slavery. Um, so that's our story here, and we'll see how it continues um, into this table of nations. And one of the last questions I want to look at here, uh, and Theodore Hebert leaves a, gives this nice article to ask the question, is uh, dividing Genesis, the role of the flood in biblical history and the shape of Israelite identity. And what he's about here is uh, I've been following uh, the standard scholarly division of, the, of Genesis into three sections. The primeval history, Genesis 1 to 11, um, the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their wives and children from Genesis 12 to, to uh, 36, and the story of Joseph from 37 to the end. But his point is that really that primeval history division at chapter 11 isn't right. The division is here. This is the new world, and this is what follows here. And after the flood, Ab yes, Abraham will come, but this table of nations is announcing the transition to a new world. And so whether we think of um, this as part of the primeval history and the story, quote unquote, really starts in chapter 12 of Abraham and Sarah, or the story starts here with the sad outcome uh, that God found that humans had filled the earth with violence and was sorry he made them, and yet even after the flood, nothing has changed. So both humans and God will have a new relationship, and we'll see how through the Table of Nations and the Tower of Babel, we see how um, the, the struggle at the broad level exists, and then we'll see it in close-ups with the family stories that follow. All right, moving to the Table of Nations next time. So